everyone, I'm Casey and I'm here with Pastor Katie. Hey guys. She is part of our JHM ministry, our junior high ministry, and we are just so excited to have you with us either online or in the room this morning for another awesome Sunday. In fact, if you are online and you're here for the first time, just let us know by putting a one in the chat. Also let us know where you're watching from. Our chat host would love to engage with you and just help you take next steps forward. But we're again, just happy you're here with us this Sunday. Definitely, and we are in a series called Slave to Nothing right now where we're talking about how we can have freedom in our finances. And I know a lot of us probably struggle in our finances. I know I do, so this series has been so good and will continue to be good. Um, And today we're talking about how money can be a tool and not a master. And Pastor Craig's gonna bring that message and it's definitely gonna be something that you should be hearing, but we are so happy that you're here. We are in our vision of grow right now. this is us in our O, in our obedience, and learning how to be obedient in our faith with our finances. So it's going to be an incredible message, and we're so happy that you guys are here. That's right. We were talking earlier on this morning just about, like, today's message in particular, who is it for? Maybe, yeah. you know, you're sitting out there, and you're like, okay, it's about finances today. Do I need this or not? Um, now, I love what you said about, like, today we're, it's going to be about focusing us around, is money a tool for us, or is it a master? And so we're kind of thinking through what does it mean if money is a master for you? How would you know if that's true? Um, We're thinking like if you you regularly have talks with your family or important people in your life and they're like, hey, you're choosing work over doing things with us as a family, if that's a chronic issue for you, then today's message is going to be hugely important to helping move that forward in your life and make money a tool instead of a master. Um, So there's lots of different ways you can think of that, but Pastor Craig's gonna bring a message today that I think will be really impactful. We also wanna shout out to Pastor Chuck and Pam who are watching online today uh, from the mountains. We're excited to have you guys on with us today. Again, if you haven't already, let us know where you are and who you're watching with. Make sure to do that if you're watching online in the chat. But we've got some exciting things coming up. I'm excited. Yes, on Friday, May 3rd, we're gonna have a chosen season four watch party. If you've never watched The Chosen, you can start watching now and kind of catch up. Uh, The first three seasons are amazing. I'm actually on season two watching it with my family. So, Mm -hmm. and they're on Netflix now. That's right. So, So watch it there. Way easier to watch now, um, but they're beautiful, amazing depictions of the biblical stories and really helps you understand Jesus and love Jesus even more. Mm -hmm. So you can catch up before we watch season four, just two episodes right here on our campus on Friday, May 3rd at 7 p.m. We're going to have free popcorn. Yes. Ooh. Yes. And treats, also other treats that you can purchase on campus as well. You can bring the whole family, but that's going to be seven to nine on Friday, May 3rd. Yes, and we would love to see you there. I know I'll be there because I got to catch those two episodes because yes. you can't watch it anywhere else. You can't watch it anywhere else other than prison. Yes. And we would rather you choose to watch it here Yeah. with us. Yeah, you can make this decision yes. to come to church that day. Way better, way better <laughs> option. Yes, but we are excited. And again, today is going to be incredible. If you would like to follow along in your notes, you can text notes to 77247 so you can follow along in the message and just get more deep into what Pastor Craig is talking about. Um, So if you're online or with us, we are so happy you're here. Again, if it's your first time, type one in the chat. I love getting to see that. I know. I always like to go on to the chat after I host B Stage to see how many people are engaging with us there. Uh, We love seeing you guys and knowing who's out there. It's hard to tell unless you put your name in the chat and let us know. Of course, if you're watching uh, the screens right now from in the building, uh, there's a couple of minutes left before the service starts. I would encourage you, turn to the person next to you maybe put down your phone for a second just one second look look to your right look to your left just you know give a little wave say hi to the person or just ask them how their day is going how their week is going because that really is the essence of church it's more than just coming to watch a service or coming to fill up with knowledge it's about being there for one another Uh, and there's something beautiful and different about the community of the church that you can't find in the world so don't walk out of the building today don't leave watching uh online without saying hi to someone else in the church today. But we want to welcome all of you who are just joining us right now. Maybe you're walking in from dropping your kids off at Kids Ministry. Maybe you're just jumping online and just wondering, what did I get myself into? Uh, Our service is going to last about an hour and 15 minutes. And in that time, you are in for a treat. We're going to worship the Lord through song. We're also going to hear an incredible message about being a slave to nothing. But right now, Crossroads, wherever you are, would you all stand and worship with us? Once again, good morning, Crossroads. 
Let's stand together and worship this morning. I don't talk like I used to 
I've been washed from the inside I've been washed from the inside Everything changed It's getting harder to recognize The person I was Before I encountered Christ I don't walk like I used to I don't talk like I used to I've been washed from the inside I've been washed from the inside church one voice we sing I cannot explain I cannot explain but nothing's more real than this in the presence of God or oh, what my heart experienced when my shame hit the wayside in my sin at the most high I was washed from the inside I was washed from the inside out Hallelujah Hallelujah I know it was the blood Could have only been the blood Hallelujah Hallelujah I know it was the blood
baptized this morning. Let's go ahead and extend a hand as we sing this next song. starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is love break it
the other church, shout Jesus from the mountains. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus. out here when she her mama was pregnant with her so I was like oh my goodness I get to see her getting baptized and it's just so exciting that we have a church that really does grow up a generation to love Jesus so it's so fun well welcome to Crossroads if you're here in the building or whether you're online or you're out on the patio we're so thankful that you've chosen to join us this morning and right now we're going to continue worshiping God through taking communion together um, and this is a time for those of us who've chosen to follow Jesus with our whole lives to take a moment and remember why we even do church in the first place. And if you're here and you are just checking out this Jesus thing, you're not sure what you believe yet, you're welcome here. We're so glad that you're here. You can feel free to skip this portion of our service and just really pray and ask God to reveal himself to you throughout the service today. Well, why do we as Crossroads do communion every Sunday? Well, it's important to us that we remind ourselves as often as we meet what the most important part of our faith is. When Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, he said these words. He said, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. Now, I love a good, concise teaching, and here Paul is so concise, and he just gives us the gospel message straight. He says, what's most important? What's most important is that Christ died to forgive us of our sins. He was buried, and he was raised on the third day, just like the scriptures said he was going to be. So when we take this bread, which represents Jesus' body that was broken for us, and this juice, which represents his blood that was shed on the cross, what we're doing is we're remembering the most important thing, because without Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we would have no Christian faith, and we would not be at church this morning. And so it's important for us to remember that when we meet um, as often as we can during a church service. So let's take some time right now to take the bread, which represents Jesus' body that was broken for us. Let's do that now. And let's take the juice, which represents his blood. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you um, that you sent your son Jesus because you loved us that much. And that he died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. And now we get to live in freedom. And we're just so grateful for that, Lord. And I just pray that we would be a people that would always remember the most important thing. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Crossroads, when you give here financially, you are really supporting a ton of great ministry that happens here throughout the week. And I wanted to give you a glimpse of the ministry that happens here every Thursday night. So take a look at this video. Steve, what are you doing? I am working out the final edits of tonight's message. I'm going to go over it and then it's time to preach.
usually we would have our five o'clock meeting with our team leads, but tonight's gonna be a little different. We're gonna be in the packing house, so we're gonna go set up the chairs and the fire pit and the environment, so when people show up, everything's ready to go. How are you guys? Oh, dude, you and Jess met. Hey, guys. Whoa, these screens are awesome. Hey, guys, thanks for setting up. Sorry. She's gonna be hosting for the first time. Come on. Uh, we're friendly, we're welcoming, we're loving on the people, we're seeing the people by making eye contact with them. And uh, we wanna make sure that's one of our core things that we do here is love the people well. Man, that was awesome getting to meet with our team. I'm so excited for all that God is doing in their life, what he's doing in our ministry. And right now, what we're going to do is we're going to go and love the people and welcome them to see us. Currently getting mic'd up uh, by the best ever over here. He uh, mics me up every single week. So this way, I don't have to hold the microphone. I get to just preach. And right now, I'm going to go up there and preach. Where our financial standings and how much money we make and how good we are at saving and how much money we have in the bank takes precedent over everything else in life. And it's like, man, coming to church or working more, I'm going to work more because I need more money. So therefore, I could buy a house or I could actually get into a relationship. And there's nothing wrong with working. I get it. We need money. But at the same time, is your financial standing taking precedent over your relationship with Jesus. Congratulations. Dude, awesome. Wow, that is a wrap for tonight. What an incredible night it was. People uh, getting closer to Jesus, giving their lives to him. Amazing community took place. And I just want to say thank you, Crossroads, for investing in what we get to do here. I love our people. I love this ministry. And I'm so excited for what God's going to continue to do. Thank you. I love Pastor Steve so much, and I feel like that video captured who he is as a pastor, saying hi to everyone, loving everyone, praying with people. Um, but that ministry is just so vital to who we are as a church, right? Because young people today, they really need truth, and they need community, and they're coming here on Thursday nights, and they're finding those things. And that's what the future of the church is you know, weighing on, is that we're doing that well. And because of your investment, because of your giving, we're able to do that well. So thank you, Crossroads, so much for being invested in the next generation. And maybe you are not somebody who gives here regularly. I would love to challenge you and invite you to start doing that because you could be a part of making stuff like that happen. Next week, Pastor Chuck's going to be talking about investing, the importance of investing in the kingdom of God. And when you give here, you're investing in the kingdom of God and tons of young people are finding Jesus because of that giving. So if you want to join us, you can text the word give to 77247 or you can find us on Venmo at, uh, at Crossroads CA or in a moment, the buckets are going to be passed and you can put cash or check in the buckets. But no matter how you give, please know that you're making a huge difference. And I am so blessed to be a part of such a generous church. Would you pray with me over this time of giving? God, I thank you for the amazing ministry that you allow us to partner with you on, God, to make um, life change happen. And I just pray your continued favor over um, the Crossroads Young Adults Ministry, Lord. I pray that they would reach the 400 that they are praying to reach every week, God. And um, so I just pray that you would bless them with that. And I pray you'd bless the people who give today that they might know that they're making such a huge difference. And would you pour out blessings on them? In your name we pray, amen. Well, we have some great events coming up, and so I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Katie and Casey up in the nest to tell you about those events. 
Thanks, Pastor Talia. As she said, we have so many exciting things coming up. Am I right, Katie? Definitely. You know, as someone who's been in the church now for, I, I sound like I'm really <laughs> dating myself, but um, I gave my life to the Lord right before I went into junior high, which is your ministry. And I think now, um, as I have kids of my own, it's just so interesting to learn uh, so much more about Jesus in such a different way. And um, one of the ways that we've been doing that as a family at home is by watching The Chosen. And so so I'm only through season two right now. Of course, I know what happens after that. But we know the end. That's right. Yes, we do know the end. But they, that show, The Chosen, is on season four right now. But, you know, the only way that you can actually watch that is either in churches or you can stream it in prison. And as Pastor Zach said a couple of weeks ago, we would rather you choose to watch it in church than in prison. So on May 3rd, which is a Friday night from 7 to 9 p.m., we want to invite you out to come here for a watch party of the first two episodes of the Chosen Season 4. We're going to have free popcorn. Your whole family can come. Uh, and of course, like we said, the show is incredible. They have such great illustrations uh, of these biblical stories, but I truly believe it will help you fall in love with Jesus at such a deeper level if you come and watch this series. You've watched through Season 2 as well? I have, yes. yes. And, and I love it. I love how real it shows Jesus yes. and how we're able to watch it. Like It's kind of like watching it happen in real time and right? with real people, and yes. it's so special. Yes, I think my kids... One of the things they've called out so far is just how much they love Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like when you see Jesus on screen in this depiction, um, I just love that. I love to feel like, wow, Jesus is so much better than we ever knew. Yeah. So we want to invite you out May 3rd. That's Friday night, 7 to 9 p.m. Yes, and we hope to see you guys there. It's going to be so good. Uh, right now, we are in a series called Slave to Nothing, where we're talking about having freedom in our finances. Uh, it's a part of our three-year grow vision. Right. And this is us in our obedience part of the grow vision, being obedient with our faith and with our finances in this. Uh, and Pastor Craig, is going to be talking about how to make money a tool and not our master. So and you know what? Maybe you have found finances in your as a master to you before. Maybe you have made the decision to go to work rather than spend time with family because you needed that extra mm -hmm. money. Or maybe you're never content with what you currently have mm -hmm. and are always looking for more. If that's kind of where you see yourself today, this message is for you. Pastor Craig has a word for you and I can't wait for us to get to hear it. That's right. Well, without further ado, would you guys all help us welcome our teaching pastor, Craig Olson. Good morning, Crossroads. How are we doing today? Happy Sunday. Uh, whether you are in the building, maybe out on the patio, the weather is starting to turn. It's beautiful outside. Maybe you're watching online. We're so glad that you are here. Uh, I uh, am uh, bringing week two of this series, uh, a series called Slave to Nothing. And last week, Pastor Chuck did an amazing job at setting up this series, helping us understand that when it comes to finances and money and all of that, it's more than just physical, it's more than just financial. There's a very real spiritual component to it. And um, I don't want to get any, I don't want to dive into this particular message yet until I address maybe some spiritual attacks or spiritual things that maybe you might be experiencing. You know, we live in a world today that wants to minimize the idea that there's certain spiritual attacks or that God isn't involved in things. And I don't think that it's a mistake for us to maybe over-spiritualize things sometimes. And when it comes to understanding different things that we are going through, I think it's really important that we actually focus on the spiritual first so that we can see God in any variety of ways in our lives, whether it's money, whether it's addiction, whether it's a broken relationship, whether it's trials that you might be experiencing in your life at work, with your spouse, with friends. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's wrong to say, God, is there something that you want to show me? Is there something that you're trying to teach me? Is there something that I need to learn from what I am experiencing? And while the world would say, you know what, this is just a, this is just a you problem. I think sometimes God wants us to understand that there's opportunities for us to lean into him. We just sang a song just a few moments ago called The Blood, and it talked about how our hearts are never the same because we've experienced Christ. And for some of you in here, you know that. You've experienced that. 
You know that your life has not been the same because you experienced him, but you responded to him. You chose to lean into that moment where you thought, oh, maybe I just am feeling weird today, or maybe it's a lack of sleep, but you chose to lean into it and say, there might be something spiritual happening in my life. There might be something that God wants me to see. And so my question for you this morning is, is there something that God has been wanting you to see? Does your heart hurt? Is it burdened? Is it bitter? Is it broken? We've all walked in with different things going on in our lives. And I don't know what it is that you might be experiencing, but I don't want to spend another second diving into this message without allowing you an opportunity to lean into this moment where maybe God's been trying to get a hold of you for a while. If that's you, I want you to know that God loves you so much. He loves you deeply. He loves you passionately. He loves you and will meet you right where you are at. But the beautiful thing about our God is because we are created in his image, the broken image that sometimes we project and sometimes that we feel like we are, God says, I'm here to redeem that and I redeemed it through my son when he went to a cross and he died on that cross for your sin, for my sin, for the sins of humanity. And anybody that would lean into that and say, I need a savior, that savior is Jesus, you will experience wholeness, you will be healed. That broken heart, that bitter heart, that beaten down heart sometimes that maybe you're experiencing, God says, I can redeem that. And so if that's you, I wanna give you a chance to respond to that. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray a prayer. And if the condition of your heart maybe has what feels like a God-sized hole, I'm gonna invite you to pray this prayer. Maybe you've never prayed it before in your entire life. Maybe you've wanted to. Maybe you have believed that you have to figure some things out first before, that you, before you can say yes to Jesus. Maybe you've believed that there's something about, I have to get well first. Jesus came and said, my message and the, the ministry that I do and everything that I am about, you have to understand healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people need a doctor. And you might be in here saying, man, I don't feel right. There's something that's not right in my life. I want you to know that there's never enough fixing that you have to do out in the world that you have to come in here to then say yes to Jesus. You can just say Jesus right where you are. And you can fully surrender yourself to him. By the way, if you're online and you're going to pray this prayer with me, when we're done praying, I'm going to invite you to text the word amen to 77247. Would you let us know that you pray this prayer? We want to walk with you. We want to encourage you. We even want to send you some resources. But we want to know that you prayed that. If you're here on site, if you're in the building, or you might be out on the patio, Myron's going to be out on the patio, by the way. If you pray this prayer, Myron will be right there. He'll lift up his hand and wave. He'll walk with you in the building because what we'll do after we pray this, we're going to stand and sing together, and we're going to rejoice. And if you pray this prayer and you mean it, if you're looking for that healing today and you desire it and you're willing to put yourself out there in this way to say, Jesus, I'm gonna trust you. I don't have all the answers, but I'm willing to lean in because I'm broken and I'm hurting. That the condition of my heart is in need of a savior. And if that's you, when we stand and sing, I'm gonna invite you to make your way to your aisle, to your stairs, uh, to the aisle that maybe is closest to you. And would you come down in front and let us greet you? We'll have a team down here. They'll congratulate you, they'll say way to go, and we'll actually have you step into a room called the living room over here. We won't keep you very long, we wanna give you a Bible to remember this decision today. To embrace this opportunity that you're willing to say, my heart hurts today, and I recognize that something spiritual is going on. And I'm here because I recognize that Jesus is my savior, and that he died on the cross for my sin. So if that's you, wherever you're at, online, patio, right in here, I invite you to pray that prayer. If you're right with the Lord today, I'm gonna to invite you to start praying for people around you. If you're ready to say yes to him, I want you to join me in this prayer. Crossroads, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Do you need him? Maybe you're far past needing him, but man, you want him so much in your life. 
Pray that you would push past whatever it is that's holding you back. If you're ready to say yes to him, pray this. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness by dying on the cross for my sins. Today I say yes to you. I say yes to your love. I say yes to your peace. I say yes to your healing. I say yes to your forgiveness. And I say yes to the life you have for me. Jesus, fill me with your love. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me yours. Make me new. Make me complete in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen if you prayed that prayer. Amen if you made that commitment. And if you made that commitment, when we stand and sing, there's something about a burden that lifts off when you make this walk. Countless of you in here have made this walk. And you know what it's like. You know that freedom that you experience. And in this moment, you truly are a slave to nothing, nothing because you just gave over everything that, you, that has been burdening you. So if you want to say yes, our team will be ready to receive you. To say way to go. So when we stand and sing, make your way to that aisle, the stairs, come forward, let us greet you. Don't let anything hold you back. Crossroads, let's stand and let's sing. If God is calling you, come. Amen. Amen. It's never been about performance, perfection, striving for acceptance. Let me tell you, it's only by the blood. It's never been about deserving or earning. It's a gift that's freely given. Let me tell you, it's only by the blood. Does anybody want to be holy? Righteous, purified and spotless Let me tell you, it's only by the blood Does anybody want to be worthy, forgiven, justified, really living? Let me tell you, it's only by the blood praise you for those decisions, Lord. We thank you for the healing. Lord, we thank you for the trust that every single one of those people have placed in you right now, Jesus, to make that known, to make that public, to declare, not just before you, God, but before men, to say, God, I'm with you, and I love you, and I thank you. Lord, we pray for those discussions that are going to be happening in there right now. I pray that freedom would truly be experienced. Lord, we thank you that you that they have recognized that you meet them right where they are at. Jesus, we love you, and we give you praise and worship because you're so worthy of it. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and believe, and all God's people said, amen. 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 You guys can be seated. Well, we're diving into week two today, and um, this truly is a spiritual matter. This truly is a spiritual matter when it comes to talking about money. And I know what some of you might be thinking already. Why in the world 
do churches talk about money so much? Why does this church talk about money so much? Well, I'm going to answer that in just, a, in just a few moments. But first, the Bible talks about a lot of different things. In fact, I'm not going to try and convince you of those things. I'm not going to try and allow, I mean, we're going to dive into Scripture. We're going to look at some stuff. But I really want the Google machine to show you what the Bible, what people want to know about when it comes to what the Bible talks about. A few weeks ago, you're going to tell that we prepped this message a few weeks ago uh, because uh, you can see very clearly it says, what does the Bible say about the first two are uh, solar eclipse and eclipse? So we did this a few weeks ago. That's an old screenshot. But if you go down that list and you begin to look, there are three things, the top three things that people, according to this algorithm that Google has put together, what does the Bible say about love? What does the Bible say about marriage? What does the Bible say about money? What does the Bible say about money? Money, tithing, and possessions are talked about, you ready for this? I want you to try and wrap your mind around this. Money, tithing, and possessions, earthly stuff, are talked about twice as much as faith and prayer combined. Think about that. Earthly stuff, tithing, money, possessions, all of that, is talked about twice as much as faith and prayer combined. I bet if I asked you to write down like the three most important things that it comes to understanding what it means to be a Christian or maybe what it means when I'm reading my Bible, things that I need, like maybe need to figure out. I bet faith and prayer are probably gonna make it in almost every single person's top three. Money might not. Money might not, and yet it's talked about twice as much in the Bible as faith and prayer combined. Approximately 2,300 different times throughout Scripture The Bible mentions money, tithing, and possessions. So why does the church, why does this church, why does Crossroads Christian Church here in Corona, California, talk about money so much? Here's how I'll answer that. Where the Bible yells, we yell, and where the Bible whispers, we whisper. Now, You're like, how do I know when it's yelling? Isn't that like a lot of exclamation points? Some of you that use a lot are like, I promise I'm not yelling, I'm just super passionate, right? If you text me, I'm probably sending back a lot of exclamation marks. Probably more than one like laughing, crying emoji because it's just, I'm passionate and I get fired up about stuff. But when the Bible yells, we yell, and when the Bible whispers, we whisper. Here's what I mean by that probably heard that before by the way if the bible talks about something over and over and over and over and over and over and over again maybe a particular topic that's talked about twice as much as faith and prayer combined we would consider the bible yelling about that not like in a harmful or demeaning or like oppressive way but just to say the bible talks a lot about it and where the bible whispers maybe there's not as many things that the bible might talk about with a particular topic It doesn't mean that it's less important. It doesn't mean that there's an ability to skirt the opportunity to be obedient in that way. It just happens to be that the Bible wants us to understand a lot of very specific things. And when it comes to money and tithing and possessions and finances and all of that, the Bible makes it clear, we want you to understand that there's something in this book that is concerned about the status of our soul, the status of our spirituality, because when we talk about money, tithing, and possessions, and all those things that are related to that, it's very much a spiritual conversation. There's, a, 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 there's, a, there's a, a, an app, a software company called Tithely, and uh, they actually put out some statistics. Uh, Jesus spoke, uh, shared 38 different parables in the Gospels, 38 different parables. Some of them are repeats that we see in the synoptic go- uh, Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke will sometimes uh, carry the same. We call those uh, the synoptic Gospels. Um, but 16 of the 38 parables that Jesus speaks about have to do with money and possessions. 16 of 38. And nearly 25% of Jesus' words in the New Testament deal with biblical stewardship. This idea that what is entrusted to us We have to make sure that we manage and that we care for and that we steward very responsibly with wisdom. Check this out. One out of 
10 verses in the Gospels deal with money. So it's more than just necessary to cover. It's actually too important to ignore. When something is talked about this much, think about, where, where are my parents? Parents, where are you guys at? Where are you guys at? Parents of small kids? Oh my gosh. I bet if I ask you, what's the broken record statement that you're saying in your house right now? You say it over and over and over again because you're trying to get some kid or kids. Don't, don't point them out. You don't need to like single them out. You're trying to get them to understand something, so you say it over and over and over again. Why? Because you know that it is important. And the Bible wants us to understand that the way that we manage, the way that we look at, the way that we handle, the way that we spiritually think about our tithe, our money, our possessions, it matters. It matters. And with this topic, it actually reveals what matters most to us. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, it says this, the place where your treasure is is the place where you will most want to be and end up being. Read that again. The place where your treasure is. The thing that matters most to you, your money will be there, you will be there, and that's where you will end up being. And most of the time, we just have to look at our bank statements. We have to look at our bank statements. We look at our checking account. We look at where has our money been going. And can I tell you, This is very personal to me. Most of the time, people that get up and preach and maybe share a message, we talk from a place of bringing biblical truth. We we bring dangerous declarations of scripture and of Jesus and the gospel of Christ to a dark world. It's one of the values that we have here at Crossroads. It's why we, we, we do this. But the reality is, is most of the things that are being communicated by a particular communicator up on this stage, they didn't necessarily deal with that particular struggle. It doesn't doesn't line up every single time. There's things that we understand. This, for me, for me and my wife, is very personal. It's very relevant. So it's not just like, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He hasn't dealt with that kind of stuff. I 100% have. I 100% have, and so I speak from a very raw and authentic and very real, I've experienced these things, and I believe that God has purposed me every time that I talk, it's why I'm so passionate about this particular topic. And you're probably thinking, classic pastor, always talking about money. I get it because I walked through it. And this was way before I became a pastor, way before I thought I would do any of this. And if you're familiar with my story, We'll go over that another time, but this was never the plan for me. But I believe that God needed me to get things right so that he could really begin to use me. He used me then, but man, did he have stuff waiting for me on the other side of obedience. You see, for a long time, I was not free in this particular area of my life. And here's the reality. I considered myself a Christian. And you're like, whoa, 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 you're starting to sound offensive. That's nothing, just wait. This was an area of my life where I thought, I'm so good in all of these other things in my life that I don't need to be okay in this area. I'm doing the extra credit. I have over 100% in all of these. I don't do one quiet time a day, God. I do two. That's not true, by the way. So I was lying to myself. But I was trying to justify why I needed to ignore this little area of my life because I thought that I was good with God with these other areas. And because I thought I was good with God, I felt like, well, I can just manipulate the message of the gospel that says you need to be fully surrendered to God. Period. I liked to present a you need to be fully surrendered to God, comma, except for maybe a couple areas where if you want to slack off a little bit, just don't slack off in these other ways and you'll still be good with God. That's what I believed. That's what I felt. I did not trust God and was therefore withholding not only what belonged to him, but what we actually have an opportunity to worship him in. We raise our hands and we sing and we clap to songs You guys might hear a point or two that you hear in a message. You're like, wow, that's really good. I'm going to clap for that. Praise God. That sounds like truth to me. But what I don't hear 
is that when we say, man, it's time to bring our tithes and our offerings to the Lord, this is exactly what it sounds like in here. That's it. That's it. I got to spend three and a half years at a phenomenal church up in Northern California, and I remember going up, and the very first time that I went to Bayside Church up in Northern California, I remember sitting in there, and this was many years ago, actually, way before this whole thing was going down here at Crossroads, ministry, all of that stuff, and I'm sitting in their service, and the guy comes out, the pastor comes out, and he goes, right now, we're going to bring our tithes and our offerings to the Lord, and all of a sudden, people started cheering, and I was like... Did somebody walk in? Like, what's happening now? What's... They cheer every single time because they want to worship and express gratitude and make it known and praise him audibly because they know that this is an opportunity not for themselves. This is an opportunity because this moment when we give to God is actually about him. What if Crossroads became that kind of a church where we said, Crossroads, we're going to continue in our time of worshiping the Lord by bringing our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. Did that feel good? I felt, I, I, I feel this like buzz. I feel this excitement, not that kind of buzz. I feel this excitement. I feel this excitement. And I wonder if we became a church where somebody walks out and you get to see an incredible video about what C is doing and we're like, we're gonna get to, we get to give to God now. We're gonna bring our tithes and our offerings to the Lord together. I wonder if we did that. Let's do it. The next two weeks, we got two more weeks in this series. Let's do it. Let's do it. You down? Let's go. Now, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you the most offensive thing that I've ever heard said in the church. I teased it Wednesday night. If you're here Wednesday night, I teased it at the end of the, end of the message. And I want to tell you the most offensive thing that I've ever heard in a church. And by the way, what I'm about to say is going to offend some of you. And you're going to find it incredibly offensive. You want to know how I know that? I told you. If you thought that other comment was offensive, just wait. I know some of you will find this offensive. And here's why I know that. Because for those of you that feel like you're about to be offended or you hear what I'm about to say, I was offended because I was in your seat. So I want you to know that if you feel offended by this, I was offended too. Here's the most offensive thing I ever heard in a church. I grew up in an amazing church. You know what this church talked a lot about? Money. Talked a lot about tithe. Talked a lot about our possessions. And I asked the same question over and over and over again. Why does my church always talk about money all the time? It's so annoying. Like it's tiresome. And every time I would hear that, I was offended. You know why? because I was not fully surrendered to God in this particular area of my life, therefore I was offended by it. And let me say this very plainly and very clearly, and I know some of you are gonna feel offended by it. Part of my job is to come up here, and if you're not offended by some of the things that I say, I'm doing it wrong, because the Bible is offensive. Because God calls us to a higher standard because we're created in his image, not the image of the world. And it's this. If you're offended by that comment, I would question that you are not fully surrendered in this particular area of your life. I'm saying, if you are offended that this church talks about money over and over and over again, I would question that your relationship with God is not where it should be, and you are not fully surrendered in this particular area of your life. You might be offended by that. I was. But I kind of got sick and tired of being sick and tired of being offended by it. And I knew deep down, I knew that all of these other things that I was like, God, we're good here, 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 and here, but there's this one thing. None of these other things offend me. I was serving. 
Church is like, we gotta, we got to find people that want to serve and impact the next generation. I was offended by that. Why? Because I was doing that. I'm supposed to like spend time with the Lord every single day and be in my Bible and, 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 and get to know him very personally, have this intentional intimacy. I wasn't offended by that. Why? Because I was doing that. I was offended by the thing that I wasn't doing because there's something deep down that we'll call it conviction. There's something there. Last week, Pastor Chuck introduced the tithe challenge. The tithe challenge is this that you would give for 90 days, for three months. That might be weekly, it might be every other week, it might be monthly, whatever it is, but you give 10% for three months in an identifiable way. Not just like you drop, you, you write a check, you give on the app, you give online, you give through Venmo, something that is identifiable. And after the three months, if you have not seen God move in some aspect of your life, and that might even be, I'm not 100% sure that I'm feeling him move. But what I would say would qualify as that is every time that we talk about bringing our tithes and our offerings to the Lord, all of a sudden I'm not feeling like, I'm not feeling offended by that anymore. I would say that would qualify. Why? Because you're doing the thing that matters. You're doing the thing that is important, just like you do all of the other things that are important. And so that's the tithe challenge, that you do that for 90 days. And if you don't experience the movement of God, if you don't experience him move in some way, we'll refund you. We'll give you your money back. We'll do that. You see, if money and inheritance and stuff and possessions and all of these things are so important, and they're a spiritual matter, then what do we need to know about them today? What are the important things? Because one of the things that we see in Scripture is these kinds of things won't bring you full joy. They won't bring you absolute contentment. Why? Because finances and all that stuff is fleeting. Look at, the, look at a guy in the Bible by the name of Job who had everything, and then all of a sudden it was gone. There's all kinds of examples. Many of you have walked some of those personal journeys before. At the end of Luke chapter 15, we read about an incredible parable that many of you have heard of called the parable of the prodigal son. And Jesus tells a story. And this guy, oftentimes we think of it as like a sinner has finally come home. But do you know the thing that this young, uh, that this young child uh, asked for his inheritance from his father and went out into the world? The thing that he thought would actually bring him happiness was money and it didn't work. And it was gone. And he had nothing. And then he came back. And then in Luke chapter 16, Jesus begins Luke chapter 16 on the heels of us understanding that money is not the end all be all. And we see it in this particular story of the prodigal son that we come all the way back out of that story into Luke chapter 16. Jesus tells a parable. It's called the parable of the shrewd manager. The parable of the shrewd manager. Shrewd means this, having or showing sharp power or judgment or being astute. Like there's something that you're really good at, like you're, you're discerning a situation really well. You've got this great power of judgment in this particular moment. Like you know exactly what you're supposed to do. And Jesus tells this parable. And there's a guy, and he's in charge of all of this stuff, and he has a manager. Manager hasn't been doing a very good job. I'm going to paraphrase the first seven sentences, uh, verses or so in this parable. The manager hasn't been doing a very good job. So the owner, this guy, calls in his manager and says, um, hey, this isn't working out. I'm giving you two weeks' notice. You're going to have to pack your stuff after two weeks, and this, just, 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 this isn't working. So this guy leaves, and he goes, oh, my goodness, this is all that I've known. This is the only job that I've ever had. I'm too proud to beg. I'm not good with my hands. I've got to figure out a way to set myself up because all of a sudden, in two weeks, I'm about to be out of a job. So this guy comes up with this, what he thinks is a shrewd plan. He's going to use this power of a very astute plan. And so this very wealthy man that he worked for had some debtors. People owed him money. People owed him. So he called in these debtors, and he calls them in, and he comes up to the, has the first one sit down, and he goes, hey, what do you owe my master? And he says, uh, I owe like a 1,000 bushels of wheat. And the guy goes, cut it in half. Only pay him 500, and then we're square. 
And the guy's like, what? Yeah, yeah, just, just cut it in half and we'll be good. Sweet, thank you. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. Calls in the next guy. How much olive oil do you owe my master? Uh, like 100 quarts. I don't know. I think that's what I owe. Let's cut it down to 80 and we'll be square. Okay, sweet, thank you. This is amazing. So all of a sudden, this shrewd manager is calling in these debtors and he's cutting their bills. He's saying, no, 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 only pay less. Here's why he's doing it. Luke chapter 16, verses eight and nine, this is what Jesus says in the parable. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it's true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly uh, possessions or use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Some of you might be thinking, what's happening here? This guy recognized that he could make friends by cutting deals with somebody. And what Jesus' point is this. When it comes to worldly matters, the world is very good at handling worldly matters. And he says, I'm going to bring in these debtors and we're going to cut these in half because I need to go to these guys that are going to be very thankful for what I've done for them. And they might give me a job because I cut their bill in half or I cut their bill by 20%. And Jesus' point is when it comes to worldly things, the world is very good. They are more shrewd than believers when it comes to this. Now, this isn't, this isn't a discussion or an invitation for believers to be like, hey, we got to step up our shrewdness and be more mean to the world. we got to rip them off more. That's not what this is about. Jesus' point is this. Look. This guy knew that possessions mattered to these people, and so because he was kind to them, he knew these guys might give me a job if I cut them a deal. If I scratch their back now, they might scratch my back in two weeks when I need a job. And so what happens is, Jesus wants us to understand we must use our money as a tool to grow God's kingdom. We have to understand that our possessions are not just our possessions. Everything that we have belongs to God. Everything that we have belongs to God. And Jesus' point is simple. Yeah, praise the Lord. Jesus' point is simple. Your money should be a tool for the kingdom of God. That's how we are to look at our finances. That's what we are to look at when it comes to our money. I want to ask you three questions, and in response to each of these three questions, I've got a key action that I'm going to challenge every single one of you to do if you haven't been doing them already. Three questions to consider regarding your money. Number one, does your money win people into God's kingdom? Does your money win people into God's kingdom? I love that Jesus calls out something in this parable that he's encouraging us to do. He points out that sometimes... Uh, He points out something that someone does is dishonest. He points it out. That's dishonest, isn't it? What that shrewd manager did was dishonest. He went and he called it out. Jesus isn't asking us to copy the behavior. Jesus wants us to understand that how we handle our finances matter. And what he wants us to do is he wants us to use our uh, uh, finances, our resources, in a way that will win people into his kingdom because he makes the point that all of this is gonna pass away anyways. Everything that we have is gonna pass away. None of it's gonna matter. And God is more concerned about what we do with it now. Why? Because you're not gonna be able to do anything with it later. And if these principles that we can live with now, we can begin to teach the people that maybe one day we'll inherit what we have and that we can teach these principles that we could understand. He's asking his disciples to be shrewd in the way that they use their money to look past just the here and now and look towards eternity. Remember, here's the lesson. Luke chapter 16, verse nine says, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. You see, Jesus speaks of the tithe to indicate this particular action. He uses the tithe to understand that this is an opportunity that we have to grow God's kingdom. Jesus is in the midst of condemning the Pharisees. If you look at Matthew chapter 23, you don't have to flip there now, um, but in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is in the midst of 
condemning the Pharisees, calling out their hypocrisy. And this is what he says in Matthew 23, 23. He says, what sorrow awaits you, uh, teachers of the religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. You see, Jesus says right here that the tithe is essential, but he also says don't stop there. Not only do you win your, not, not only do you use your money to win people to the kingdom of God, to expand the kingdom of God, to recognize that you do what you can now to grow God's kingdom, and it will actually have an eternal impact in people's lives. He says the tithe is just the minimum. What he actually points to is, are you able to embrace the more important aspects of the law? Do you care for people beyond just checking a box? Some of you are like, I tithe and that's it. Don't ask me to help anybody else. I'm not lifting a finger. Some are on the other side. Look, I help people and I do what I can, but I don't tithe. God doesn't need my money. You know what? When you say God doesn't need my money, I won't disagree with you. He doesn't need your money. But you know what he wants? He'd rather have your heart. And the way that you handle your finances showcases what, your, what the position and the, and the condition of your heart is in. He doesn't need your money. God's going to do what God's going to do. He wants you to be a part of it, and he wants your heart to be in it. And the more that our hearts are tied to him and not tied to our wallets, the more that we're going to experience beyond just the material stuff here, but we're going to be able to focus our attention to eternal matters, things that matter, things that will matter for all time, beyond what we can comprehend. That's what's important. You see, the Pharisees, they couldn't accept Jesus' teaching. They couldn't do it. My question for you, though, will you? Will you accept God's teaching? You see, growing God's kingdom involves surrendering your time, your talent, and your treasure. Here's the key action. The question was, do you use your money to grow God's kingdom? The key action here is start tithing. Start tithing. If you look biblically, you start at 10%. That's what the tithe literally means. That's why we're challenging and putting forth the tithe challenge. 90 days, identifiable giving, and if you don't see the Lord move, we'll give it all back to you. Second question I want you to consider. Are you faithful in the small things? Are you faithful in the small things? Luke chapter 16, Jesus continues in this parable, verses 10 to 12. He says, look, if you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? You see, our society lives and dies by comparison. Not only what we have and what we do and the things that we are clamoring for, but we also do it from a sin perspective. Where we look at, well, I'm not being like morally, like that morally bad. I'm just, I'm just not trusting God in this particular area of my life. And this is a dangerous thing because partial disobedience is still full disobedience. In Malachi chapter 9, verses 8 through 10, this is what the Lord says. You have cheated me of the tithes and the offerings due to me. You're under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you and I will pour out blessings so great that you won't have enough room to take it and try it. Put me to the test. For my wife and I, we struggled in this area of our lives when we first got married. And you know what we said? I think a lot of us will probably say this. We couldn't afford to tithe. We couldn't afford it. So we made excuses. We finally were able to get it right because we started to do something. We started to do something that mattered. Dave Ramsey, whether or not you agree with his principles and all of that, we actually have Ramsey Plus available for every single person to take advantage of. Uh, if you go on and uh, you, can, uh, you can do that, we'll have, a, we'll have some great next steps for you here in just a little bit. But Dave Ramsey says this, if you don't tell your money where to go, you won't know where it went. 
And judging by some of the bottom lines that we have at the end of our month, some of us, we wonder, like, where did my money go? Now, before I jumped into any of this, before I jumped into any of this, I once lived a life where I was an accountant. It's true. I was an accountant. I graduated from business school, had an emphasis in accounting, and I started working for a CPA firm. And I started doing I did it for three years. You see, some people would say, I'm not good with my money because I'm just not good at numbers and money. What was my excuse? I was terrible with my money. I knew all about it, but I was terrible. Why? I was selfish. I did not trust God in this area. I didn't trust him. So what I would do is I would actually invite you to, uh, and I'm going to do it right now, I'm going to invite you to a financial counseling session right now. In fact, Shane is going to come out, she's going to wheel out a TV uh, for me, and I'm going to walk you through an incredible tool that you can use. Because some of you might think, well, I don't really know, uh, I don't really know how to budget, I don't really know anything about that, I'm not good at it, and so uh, I'm going to invite you to, uh, 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 to, to do some budgeting with me, and um, Here we go. Let's take a look at this. There we go. This is the Ramsey uh, budgeting tool right here. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, that you can start budgeting today because if you don't tell your money where to go, you won't know where it went. Now, here's what's amazing. You're going to have an opportunity to scan a QR code when this is all done to start budgeting. Some of you can't budget. Some, some, sorry, some of you can't tithe because you don't have a budget. As an accountant, a former accountant, I try to block out that part of my life now. <laughs> As a former accountant, I would tell you one of the most important things you could ever do for yourself, not just for the here and now, but for the spiritual implications of your relationship with God is to have a budget. You ready? This is amazing. This right here, start plugging stuff in. Let's say you make $5,000 a month after taxes, okay? Okay. What this does is this, this uh, budgeting tool actually begins to auto-populate some expected expenses that you might have. One of the first things, and the first thing, it says $500 for tithe. That's 10%. Some of you might say it like this. Well, do I tithe off my gross or do I tithe off my net? And I heard somebody say this one time. I loved it. There's nothing like, there's nothing, like spiritual about it I just really liked it, and it's what we do. So if you ask the question, should I tithe off my gross or tithe off my net, I would ask you, do you want God's gross blessings or do you want God's net blessings? <laughs> Brilliant. My wife and I, we want God's gross blessings. Financial gross, not like yucky gross, because they're amazing. Okay, so what happens is you begin to go through and you can begin, you can start using this budgeting tool this month. You can look back at March. Say, what happened in March? How did we just get obliterated in March? You go through and you begin to look at it. There's no savings. This would assume that you're paying down debt. Food, $650 a month. Uh, you know what's not included in this one? Coffee budget's not in there. So there you go. <laughs> $950 instead of $650. Utilities? Yeah, it's not super hot out yet. But when the AC starts pumping, you know, some of you are looking at that. Some of you might put a one in front of that five for your uh, utility bill. Housing? <laughs> California? <laughs> I'm here at three? Three? Sounds like the price is right down here. Three? Can I get a four? $32.50. Oh, those expenses are starting to go north. Transportation? These gas prices? Oh my goodness, that's insane. Insurance, that's terrible. Household items, I mean, if you start maybe brushing your teeth every other day, I don't know. <laughs> Good luck. Debt, that yeah, seems fair. Retirement, not even close to that. Personal entertainment, this is the one that would probably get you every time. In fact, I'd probably say it's probably like that. Other, I don't even know what other would look like, but here's the damage. All of a sudden, at the end of the month, you're looking at, you're not even sure how you can do it. You're not even sure how you can survive. 
You see, oftentimes the first step to be able to begin tithing and being obedient is to understand, I got to tell my money where to go. And this is really hard. This is really hard for my wife and I. My wife and I, this is glory to God, but also us denying ourselves. My wife and I have not had a car payment in 12 years. Yeah, 12 years. And you might be thinking, what terrible car are you driving around? (laughs) Well, let me tell you what cars I've driven around. A 2000 Toyota Camry. They don't even make those anymore. I don't even think they make a Camry anymore. I don't know. A 2000 Toyota Camry. I currently drive, you ready for this? A 2002 Ford Explorer. My dad deconstructed the entire engine and then put it all back together. That thing has 215,000 miles on it, and I will drive that thing into the ground. (laughs) I will drive it into the ground. Now, we've been blessed. I'm gonna tell you, we've been blessed. The short story is we had a family that wanted to sell us their car because they wanted to buy another one, and all they said was, if you sell your car, whatever it is, and it was older, whatever money you get from the sale of that car, just put it towards, and you give that to us, and we will sell the car for you for that much. You can't make that stuff up. That's the kind of stuff where I genuinely believe that God put us in that place. Why? Because for a long time, I drove around that 2000 Toyota Camry. You see, sometimes it starts with denying ourselves, and it looks like, boy, I'll tell you what, if I could take out, you know, zero debt here, that all of a sudden begins to chip away, that all of a sudden, and I'm wondering what in here, for you and I today, we need to begin to deny ourselves, because the reality is, is the Lord doesn't want us to touch this number right here. He wants us to trust him first, so that we're not touching it first, or touching it later. He wants us to understand, you need to trust me in this particular area. This particular tool is available to every single one of you. Uh, This actually will be up on the screen, and you can scan that QR code, and you can have that today. Um, But I want you to understand, there's so much at stake. There's so much at stake when we understand that we have to begin budgeting. Track one month, see how it goes, see what it looks like. What will that look like? There's a QR code up on the screen for you to be able to use. Number three, my last question for you is this. Do you serve God or do you serve your money? At the end of this parable, Jesus says this. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. I'm convinced, my wife and I are both convinced that our full-time call into ministry never would have happened if we didn't get this particular area of our life right. And we have trusted God in the area of our tithe for well over 13 years now. We've been married for 15 years, almost 15 years. The first couple years were tough and we didn't trust God. And we both loved God. We both served, we did everything, but it was this area. And let me tell you, This isn't like, this isn't put on, this isn't a show. I'm telling you very honestly, we have never not made it any month since we began to be faithful to him in this particular way. Never, (laughs) never once. And I know that's the fear. We, We lived in that fear every single day. Do you serve God or do you serve your money? You see, the Lord was so incredibly faithful to us. The key action here, number three, is this, start living free. What would it look like if every single one of us began to live free? Why? Because it all begins with us trusting God in this particular area of our lives. And I wanna go back to that offensive statement that I made. If this is offensive to you, if what I said earlier was offensive to you, sit with that this week. It offended me over and over and over again, and I buried it, and I pushed it away, and I got mad, and I was like, well, whatever, I'm doing all the other things, so leave me alone. But God truly had so many incredible blessings. And I believe that there are some earthly blessings that we've experienced. We haven't had a car payment in 12 years. Doesn't mean I got a fancy car driving around. I don't got that. But it's a car. And I believe that there's blessings that we've experienced on this side of heaven. But more importantly, there's blessing on the other side of heaven when we choose to trust him in this. 
Let me leave you with this. Jesus is having a very spiritual conversation with some of his disciples. And he says this, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Last thing I'll tell you, this is not something that God wants from you. It's something that God wants for you. Amen. And so, God, we commit ourselves to you in this way. Pray for the hearts in here that might have been pricked or might have been stinging or might have felt offense or hurt. Like it says in Malachi, pray that they put you to the test. Lord, I know you won't let them down. I know know you'll show up in a profound way that will blow them out of the water beyond what they could even compare or understand. So, Jesus, thank you that this isn't something you want from us. It's something you want for us. We love you and we worship you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and believe. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. You guys have an amazing day. Thank you for being here. We'll see you Wednesday night. Take care. Decision to follow Jesus today. If you haven't let us know you made that decision for God, man, just text the word amen right now to 77247. I also want to invite you to gather your friends and family to be part of our family by joining us right here online next week. We're live on Wednesdays at 6.30 and Sundays at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So if you're watching on YouTube, just hit that subscribe button right now and you'll never miss out on one of our new messages. If you'd like to experience God in a deeper way and grow in your understanding of the Bible, we've got groups that meet online throughout the week to connect you with other believers. All you have to do is text the word online to 77247 to find a group. Finally, If your life is being impacted by Crossroads, and if you want to be a part of making an impact all over the world, you can text the word GIVE to 77247 to make a financial gift today and be a part of life change. Well, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.